I'm Rick DeSanctis, and welcome to The Catholic Shepherd. This is our first, I think you call them a podcast. This is our first podcast, and we're going to be talking about the Catholic Church and what goes on within the Church, and basically helping people who are Catholics get excited about their faith. Now, there are many of you out there who are not Catholics, and there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're going to church and you believe in God, happy. The reason that we do what we do here on The Catholic Shepherd is because many people out there in these days really don't take their faith serious. They don't believe that God exists. And a lot of people actually leave the Catholic Church because they don't know what they have in the church. So I'm not a preacher. I'm not a priest. I'm not a deacon. I'm not a monk. I'm not even a religious. Um, at best, I'm a wretched sinner. And uh, I'm actually a little intimidated to do this, but I feel as though it needs to be done. So let's begin, shall we? This is our first podcast ever. Super excited and super grateful to Saugus TV for allowing us to do this. And it's going to be all over Saugus for starters. Then you're going to be able to see these on YouTube and you can grab them everywhere, all over the place. So let me begin. Um, so I am a 50-year-old guy. No, I'm 49. I'm going to be 50. And uh, I am not the holiest of guys. I am not the best of guys. I am just an average person like the rest of you. But I do go to Mass weekly. I do say my prayers daily, nightly, weekly. I say the rosary. I always look to our mother for our intercession, for her to pray to us. Um, and I try to do my good works and good deeds for whatever that is. But I want to say it was about maybe 15 years ago that I had a reconversion to the Catholic Church. Not just to faith, but to the Catholic Church. During that time, I was going through turmoil. Uh, we all go through our turmoil. And what happened was... I went to a Catholic conference. It was in downtown Boston, and there were three rock stars in the Catholic Church. I call them rock stars because I actually got inspired by these people. And one of them was Romero Cantalamesa. He was the uh, papal preacher to Pope John Paul. The next guy was Dr. Scott Hahn, who was a professor in Franciscan University. And then there was a guy by the name of Father John Carapi, who has since left the priesthood. Doesn't matter. Uh, which leads perfectly into where I'm going. Why it doesn't matter is Father Karapi was talking about the Catholic Catechism. He put out a 46 CD collection on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you're probably saying, well, what's, what's the Catechism? What's that word even mean? Um, to quote him, it's a Greek word, which comes from katecheo, which means to echo back. It's a Greek word. Why does that matter? Because we echo back what the church has always taught and always believed. Now, in this day and age, there are over 50,000 denominations of Christian belief. Well, it wasn't always that way. It started somewhere, and it started with the Catholic Church. And some of you who are not Catholic may be at home right now challenging me, going, no, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. That's fine, we'll get into it in another show. But for now, you're going to have to trust me. So anyways, it's a 46 CD collection on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I am going to show you what a catechism looks like. It's an awesome little booklet, guys. This book right here is what we call the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's super thick, and you don't want to read it like a novel. You want to use it as a reference book. Now, many people out there are saying, well... Bible alone. Yes, absolutely. The most important book out there is the Bible. Absolutely. But a lot of people on the outside of the Catholic Church, they wonder, why do Catholics do what they do? Why do they do that? And where does the church stand on this? Because there's so much confusion out there. Well, guess what? The Catechism of the Catholic Church was a book, and it compiled all of the church teachings, all the way back from, let's say, Councils of Trent and Nicaea, um, all the way back to Jesus' time. In fact, there are church fathers who went out into the woods, into the desert, we call them, the desert fathers, and they took all of this literature, they compiled it, and eventually before the Bible became an actual Bible or a, uh, the canon of the Bible, all of these documents were saved and stored. And uh, it slowly, we evolved into the catechism. Now, you're probably wondering if the catechism is like this crazy... Uh, cultish type thing, and it's not. I promise you. I actually challenge you to prove me wrong. Pick up a Catholic catechism. I don't care what denomination you are, and challenge it. And if you go to the back where the index is, it'll basically show you when you're looking in the catechism, you can figure out whatever it is you want to figure out. 
You want to learn about why we receive communion. When we, le when we learn it, why we learn it. You want to find out um, why we should get married in the church. You want to find out what's going on with why priests wear black with a white collar. Go to the catechism. Long story short, the catechism's where it at. So, here I am today, guys. Super excited to be with you. Again, our first podcast. Super nervous to be here doing this. But, in my heart, and I mean this with all my heart, it excites me to see people get excited about the faith. And when I say the faith, we're always seeking the truth. There can't be 20, 30, 40,000 denominations of truth. There can be 40,000 opinions, but there can only be one truth. You can take one plus two and make it three, but let me tell you something, it'll never equal one. You know, facts are facts, truth is truth, and you can't divide it into sections. So what I'm going to do over these series is hopefully inspire maybe one of you to go back to church. If you get excited and you go back to church, I'm excited for you. And again, if you're a good Protestant brother or sister out there, keep doing what you're doing. I just want you to, for five seconds, check out the catechism and don't put the Catholic Church down until you know what you're talking about. I challenge you to do that and I challenge you with love. I ask the Holy Spirit to pray for us, Jesus, pray for us, and help us to be better people and inspire us to get to where we need to be. So, before I carry on, at the beginning of each show, you're going to hear me basically give a little dissertation on where we're at and where we're going. And then, we're going to divert back and we're going to sit down with guests preferably people who have become Catholics or reverted back to the Catholic Church through the years and ask them why they did so. And again, all just normal people, just like you and I. Again, I'm not a priest, I'm not a monk, I'm not a deacon, although many of my friends like to make fun of me and say that I should have been a monk. I'm not just a plain old married guy raising kids, going to work every day. And by the way, I do marketing for a living. Why do I tell you that? Because marketing is the same thing as evangelizing. And I feel as though God has put it on my heart. He's given me a platform to have a TV, a radio show, a newspaper, which you can see right behind me up on the wall. This is what we do, and this is why we're excited. So guys, stay tuned, because in just a moment, we're going to flash back, and we're going to interview a few people. So guys, thanks for tuning in to The Catholic Shepherd, the very first show. I want to wish you a happy feast day from Father David at St. Adelaide's and all of us here at St. Adelaide's. God bless you. Welcome back to The Catholic Shepherd. I hope you enjoyed our intro and our little commercial in between there with Father Dave, who's from St. Adelaide's. Um, so my first guest today, actually my first guest ever, is going to be Father Dave Affleck. How you doing? Very good. Thank you. Awesome. Good to be here. Thank you so much for coming on our first show here in The Catholic Shepherd. Um, I want to say happy feast day to everybody out there, which today is the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which has a very big significance in all of our lives, which we'll get into maybe later on. What we're going to do with our guests on every episode is I'm going to ask them about their Catholic faith, where they came from, how they got there, why they love their Catholic faith, and uh, if they're considering on leaving or why they came here. So you know what? I like to get out of the way. I like to joke that I'm like Marcus Grodi from EWTN. I'm nothing like him. Uh, but we're going to start off with the first question. So uh, you're a Catholic priest? Yes. That's it's true. obvious you have a collar on. Yep. And i got to tell the guests out there, not only is he a Catholic priest, he's married with children. How dare I say that in the Catholic Church? Is this true? This is true. It is true. I don't think I want to go there yet, but you're a Catholic priest. And uh, how long have you been a Catholic priest? I've been a Catholic priest for uh, six years now. Mm-hmm. And did you aspire to be a Catholic priest? Were you always a Catholic? Let's start there. I think that's a great question for you. Well, that's really the important question uh, because I did convert to the Catholic faith, mm -hmm. and that whole process is in itself a long story. And I think you'd like to have it somewhat condensed. So it's important to realize that I did not come to the Catholic Church as somebody who did not already believe in Christianity. I did believe in Christianity. In mm -hmm. fact, I believed very much in Christianity. I was uh, ordained as an Episcopal minister uh, in the Episcopal Church to refer to as, as Episcopal priests. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that capacity, I served for about, um, in, uh, for about 13 years, just under 13 years. And in, 
as an Episcopal priest, um, I was not discontent with the church itself, with the Episcopal church as a denomination for most of that time. But over time, as sort of time went on for me, there were some points of discontent that I began to see in the church, uh, the Episcopal church, that uh, raised a number of really significant questions for me. And I kept trying to find answers to those questions. And um, the process of discovering the answers to those questions is, I believe, what brought me to the Catholic faith. So can I ask you a question? You can. So you're an Episcopalian. Yes. You're hanging out in your Episcopalian church, which means you were a priest. Were you a priest? Well, That's they correct. Consider, they considered you a priest? That's correct. So you're a priest in your church, and you're feeling discontent. And uh, not at the church, just there was uh, restlessness. That's inside. important to say that it's not with the people, it was not with the parish per yeah. se, but with the denomination and yeah. it's at a national level. Is I it fair say. to say you had a different calling? Something was calling, a tugging, maybe? Well, I would call it a discontent, okay. a, a, and, you know, a, a inspirational discontent uh, that, that, needed to be, that needed to be filled. And it was the coincidence at the time I had moved from the West Coast, living on the East Coast, and uh, the coincidence was I was introduced to a gentleman uh, through an ecumenical uh, minister's association. He was not a minister. He was not in that capacity. He was just known in the community. And uh, we just hit it off. And uh, we started to work on a project that he was working on together with respect to uh, drug awareness. And because he was a man of faith and I was a man of faith, our, con our conversations just sort of centered around faith. And he was a Catholic, and he was a mm. very devout Catholic. And he introduced me to other Catholic men, and to make a rather long story less long, is to say these Catholic men, and through my friend, uh, asked, could we pray together? And I said, well, sure, why don't we do that? And we began to pray in the morning, at 6.30 in the morning. We began by, I said, well, you know, in the Episcopal Church, we have something called morning prayer. Mm -hmm. And why don't we do that? That would make the most sense. And he told me that, well, we have something, too, that's like morning prayer, uh, and it's called Christian prayer. So I looked at what, what they had, which is very similar. In fact, they both originate from the same source, actually. And it was a series of psalms and prayers and scripture readings. And so we gathered on 6.30 in the morning, and that process, we started out with a few men. I forget what the number was. Uh, we would grow up to, say, 10 or 12 guys. We sometimes go out to breakfast, have more conversations. So which, can I interrupt you? Sure. Was it all Catholic men showing, or were there Episcopalians showing? Well, I did invite the par the Episcopal parish, but we didn't get a response there. So they were all Catholic men. Uh, so in the beginning, yeah, something was stirring. Catholic guys were kind of around you, and yes. hmm, why is this? Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, every time a new man would come, um, often someone would take one of the books. So I'd go over to the Catholic bookstore yeah. <laughs> and get another Christian prayer, and then... Uh, then we needed some more because somebody else came and uh, they wanted to take them home. So anyway, I kept going back and forth. It was a couple of miles away. In the meantime, I began to pray this prayer, the Catholic prayer, the morning prayer myself. And I found it very rich. And at the same time, kind of coincidentally, somebody that I'd known or knew uh, mentioned something about the catechism of the Catholic Church. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Yeah. Did you hear that, people? Well, I know that's important to what you're doing. Very important. But I, it, it really is true. Yeah. And I, so when I was going to the store, the Catholic bookstore, I found one and I picked it up because I was interested in learning more about the virtues. And I just, it took hold of me. And then I went to a, uh, what eventually I went to what was called the four volume mm -hmm. uh, of the Liturgy of the Hours. And through the prayer of the church and through reading on a daily basis both scripture, the Psalms, and they also had a number of, they'd always have a daily reading of a church father, which are those ancient Christian uh, sort of uh, holy men of the first five or six centuries. That's what the church fathers typically are referred to as, that they would have uh, an excerpt from a, perhaps a sermon or something they had written that was pertaining to the day. And between the prayer itself, reading the catechism, what I realized that I had come upon was the answers to the questions that were very deep inside of me mm. as to the direction in the future, which is a problem. So at this point, <laughs> you became, uh-oh, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I'm called somewhere else. Is that what happened? It isn't so much that. Is that is that when you realize that there is a truth here that I have to respond to, 
and that truth requires an action on my part, that's when the trouble occurs because at that point, I was what, 58 years old, 57 years old, and I have to think about what my future is going to be, what, what's going to happen next in my life, how can I resolve all the work I have done up to this point, and I was just completing my doctorate of ministry at this point, that what do I do now? Can I continue on as an Episcopal priest, uh, knowing what I know? Uh, can, do I have to leave the Episcopal Church? Do I have to become a Catholic? I mean, what, what do I do? This, this becomes the, 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 really the question. And as I was sort of you know, really struggling with this, I should say really working, deliberating in myself about what to do, um, I would say <laughs> God's uh, wonderful nature is such that he uh, brought me to a point of decision. And the point of decision was I would have to, uh, because of circumstances in the parish, it was going to be necessary to really start thinking about another, another position in the Episcopal Church. Mm. And so I began to apply. So let me stop you right there. Sure. So you're a priest in that church, what they would call a priest. Mm -hmm. um, is it a paid position? So Absolutely. You went to, so in essence, like a Catholic priest, that was your role as a priest. You basically, um, you got paid by the church, you lived the church, and that was your life. So to think anything outside of that must have been really intense. Like, what would I do next? Something that kind of area? Absolutely. Yeah. See, I, I didn't, you don't just sort of just happen. You know, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of expenditure of money to be trained, to go to seminary that I spent on my own. There are a number of years invested in my in this career, if you want to think it in those terms. Sure. I, I had uh, worked very hard on learn, going on to advanced studies. And so now to walk away from that is to walk into a void. What do I do? Now where do I go? How do I make this decision? You see, so this, this is where I'm at. And I really had not talked to my, even my wife at this point about this. This was all going in, inside. And it was a particular um, moment when I was interviewing on the phone with, this, with one, uh, what they call a call committee from this one pair, Episcopal Church. And they were asking me questions, and I was trying to respond to them with integrity. And I walked away from that phone conversation realizing that it would not be possible for me to continue. To, it would not be right for me. I would, it would be against my conscience to seek a, any position in the Episcopal Church knowing now what I knew. Mm. And there was only one response I could make, and that would be to become a Catholic. <laughs> and, uh, and truthfully, at that moment, it was not, you know, the, there was something beautiful and wonderful about it, but there's also something very frightening about that. Yeah, I could see that. And that's when I had a conversation with my wife about it. And How'd that she, go? How would that conversation go? Well, that's... <laughs> She, um, she listened. She's always been very supportive of me, but she was not in favor of this. She uh, was a yeah. lifelong Episcopalian, very devout, and that's something we shared in common mm. uh, that helped our marriage to be rich. And um, on the other hand, she's also very open. And so it, it, the irony was we, I had to go down for the graduation <laughs> for my doctorate of ministry, and I had received uh, before that, I should back up just a moment, I, I'd run into this fellow that looked a lot like you. Interesting. Actually, it was you. You know that. <laughs> so I, I had to go to a bank yeah. in, in town, and the town, I never go to this bank. I don't, I don't do business at the bank. I think, I, I, forget, I think the church, I don't even know why I went to this bank, but I had to go for whatever reason, make a deposit or something. And you were walking out the door, and you said something to me that, that was... Um, it was very, it was both startling, and it was a, it was a life changing moment. He said, "You know, you can become a priest in the Catholic Church, or something to that effect." <laughs> and and I thought, "Huh?" I remember the moment. Yeah. And then you referred me to something called the Coming Home Network. Yeah. And I had contacted them. Actually, they were very helpful, and sent me some books and sent me some conversation. We had conversation. They sent me some material. Anyway, I gave I, I gave my wife two of these books to read, and one was on Mary. It was written by Scott Hahn, which was I it was for me was extremely important. And another one on the history of the church. She read both of them as we flew down to the graduation. It was a down southern southern states, and uh, by the time we got back, she had said, "I'm going to call the church and find out about RCIA." RCIA is what the uh, it was the, the uh, put it in simple terms, it's, 
It's the initiation into the Catholic Church. So someone process. coming into the church would right. have to go what's called the RCIA. Okay, right. right. It's in the Catechism, by the way, in right. case you're wondering. Right. So it's it's the process of see we did in so many denominations you just become that denomination. Right. You just Baptized. sort of walk in. Well, you don't have to do that. You just walk in and say I, I want to be an Episcopalian today, and you go well, fine. Right. You know that sounds good. Why don't you? And again, we're not but, knocking any uh, specific no, no. churches. We just we fell in love with the Catholic Church, and there are things that drew us there. And again, we believe it to be the truth. Um, there is some truth in everything. There can't be the fullness in tr of truth everywhere. There's. I, I, do you agree with that? Absolutely. And the Church, the uh, Catholic Church, takes very seriously this this process of initiation, yeah. and it wants people to understand what they're doing. So um, she started that or made that initial call. Uh, we were able to make. We waited. We had to wait about four months before they started another program, and uh, so that was that was part of what I was doing, and that's how it went. So, all right. So here's this guy. He's an Episcopalian priest. He devoted his entire life to what he was and what he knew and what he did. Years of college, I would presume. You wind up living wherever you're living at the time, and you're like, "What am I going to do now?" Because I'm feeling called to be in the Catholic Church. Now, mind you, people out there, um, as an Episcopalian priest, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, um, you can't just leave and become a priest. That's not how it works. What happened was, as I would presume, is that you had to leave your post, in essence, become a Catholic, go through that process, and then begin the journey to become a deacon and then a priest, I would presume. Is that how it goes? Well, yes, it is, but it, I want to correct that slightly. Okay. In my case... I did not come. I did not come into the Catholic Church so that I could be a priest. Correct. I came into the Catholic Church because it's true, and I came to believe that the Church Christ established subsists in the Catholic Church, and that is the critical element for me. That I had to do what was true and mm. respond to truth. So that meant becoming Catholic. That was the first step. Anything that happens after that. I didn't. I was open to, but I was not looking for that to happen. In mm. fact, it, there was a four-year period of time before I was ever ordained, and that's extremely important for for me. That was extremely important, and I pointed that out, of course, to my wife that I was not becoming Catholic to be a priest. Right. I was coming a Catholic to respond to what's true, and the process of becoming a priest. Uh, is, was made possible by John Paul II in 1980 with this thing they called the pastoral provision. Mm -hmm. And the short history of it is a number of priests in America who had been Episcopalians in conversation or petition with the Pope um, uh, asked if, if there was a way they could be ordained as Catholic priests and remain married. It's very important to understand that a person can be married and be ordained, yeah. but you cannot be ordained and then become married. Mm. That, Yes, yes. That's in a, the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church. In the it? Eastern Church, which is a whole other show. Yeah, we're not going to. I can't, gonna go I can't speak to yeah, that. Yeah. But I can say this, that's an important distinction to make. So there, it is possible for the Pope to um, uh, dispense a man from that, that impediment. And that's what the provision does. But it's very carefully managed and very carefully uh, organized so that there's a lot of training mm -hmm. and, and goes on involved with it. And now... A lot of that, I think, has gone over to the ordinariate, which is something yeah, which altogether. is another show, which is another deal. Um, so we're trying to keep our show really short. And being our first show, I could go on with you forever. I'm sure we could do another full show, and maybe we will. Maybe we'll do a part two. Um, but I want, at this point, I think we have about four minutes left. What I want to do with you is, I want you to tell me if there was something key that brought you into the church, or something that maybe um, you won't leave the church. That reason. And uh, I just want to say again, guys, you know, this is a, a big move to walk away from something that you held hard. So, again, I don't want to waste your time. Well, there was a certain irony and something very beautiful because I've talked about those things that are more um, physical, you know, the people, the books, so on, and the reading. But I also believe there's a supernatural element that brought me to the church, and there are a lot of stories behind that that I'm not getting into today. But there were two that were very important for me, or two things. One of them is the Eucharist itself and the real presence of Christ in the Catholic Church, which I always felt when I came into a Catholic Church but did not understand what it was. But I knew it was there. And secondly, it was Our Lady, the Blessed Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And 
to become a Catholic, there, there's a whole process of trying to understand because that's not part of the tradition within Protestantism, generally speaking. And I had to go through that as well. But there were moments where some impossible things were presenting them to themselves to me, and I, I was desperate to find a solution to, the ant to, to this problem, uh, which I want to get into right now. And I remember praying to Our Lady, and uh, I was driving home, and I, I drove, and I, and, I, and I gave this to her. And when I got home, the answer was awaiting me mm. <laughs> to this very impossible situation. And it really opened my eyes. And so since then, I've had a deep devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I believe that she is intimately responsible for bringing me into both the Catholic Church, but also into the priesthood mm. that on my own would not have initiated or been the person, uh, the means by which this happened. And mm -hmm. I think that's quite interesting because today is uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Feast Day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Patron of the Americas. Yeah, patroness of the Americas. If we have this on camera right now, you have to see a shot of this because this is Our Lady of Guadalupe. And uh, I got to be honest with you, we only have a couple of minutes, but I have to get this in. Past couple of months, I personally have um, studied Our Lady of Guadalupe, and there is a tremendous amount of miracles, and it sounds crazy to the average person. I challenge you all to go and actually check that out. Go find out about Our Lady of Guadalupe. Again, today's the feast day. I think it's beautiful that we're here and that you gave me this, and it all kind of goes together. Um, I think it's a huge testament to who you are that you stepped out of who you are to follow your heart and, the, and what we both believe is to be the truth. I mean, just amazing. So, Thank you, Rick. Yeah, so I got about a minute left. So my last question to you is, so you serve as a priest now. Are you retired or are you still going? I'm in, yes, I'm in the diocese of, I am retired. I'm in the, di I am incarnated, which is a phrase I should say. I, I'm associated with the diocese of Portland, Maine, mm -hmm. which is the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. But I also have faculties or ability to serve is a way of saying that in the Diocese of Manchester, which is New Hampshire. Okay. So I currently, um, although I'm retired, I assist or help a priest in a parish in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. And that's been a great blessing for me. It's, it's uh, helped me to continue on in my priesthood. And uh, to um, I've been richly blessed. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's so important that I have discovered, which you may want to talk about it some other time, is not just the Eucharist, but also the power of the sacrament of reconciliation, of penance, of confession. Because for me, to be able to, uh, be able to, be able to have the privilege of hearing confession, I am blessed because I know that the Holy Spirit <laughs> works in me to be able to be a good confessor. Mm, amen. So um, this is our first show. I don't even know what to say about it. I think it was one of the best shows we've ever had. Absolutely. Um, and we got a lot more going on. And I know for a fact that we could probably, we could carry on hours about this. And I think we should. I'm going to have you back. We're going to have another talk and continue this if you'd like, if you'd you know, uh, do that for me. Um, so guys, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of these. Again, they're the Catholic Shepherd series. And each one is going to be based on something a little bit different. Today, it happened to be on a a guy who I knew who became a Catholic priest who was an Episcopalian. Um, but again, it all kind of centers around truth. And uh, I'm going to say this for the record. Don't believe us. Challenge us. Pick up a Catholic catechism. I think, uh, again, Father Dave, you agree the catechism is kind of like the teaching and the end-all, be-all to explain what we believe as Catholics. And that's kind of what it is. So uh, once again, thank you My so pleasure. much for coming on to this uh, TV show. I can't wait to see where this goes, and uh, God bless you in your ministry. Would you do me a favor? Absolutely. Would you look into your camera and bless the uh, people watching out there for us? May Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's a Thank pleasure you. to be with you. Thank you so much, Father.